Um, thanks a lot, everyone, for uh, having me uh, here today. It's my first time at Brucon. Um, I'll make sure it's not the last. I really, uh, really like it here. Um, thanks to all of you for being here this morning uh, with the party. I know uh, maybe choices had to be made. So thanks, and I'll take it as a personal challenge to keep you awake. Um, quick intro about myself. Uh, so Sabine Dargueuve, I'm French. Um, I've been working for a bit more than 20 years in IT security, cybersecurity. First uh, with Active Directory, I uh, went, uh, went through the um, transition from NT4 to Windows 2000 domains with uh, GPOs as we, as we know them almost today. Um, I've been a penetration tester for uh, three or four years. That was a lot of fun, lots of learnings that I still use uh, daily in my job uh, today. I've worked in uh, PCI DSS projects, uh, very interesting uh, as well. And for the past few years, I've been working on the defensive side of things, uh, vulnerability management and scans and so on. And mostly today, uh, digital forensics, incident response uh, and incident uh, management. So I'm head of cyber defense at uh, Danone. Um, for those who may not know the company, it's a French company, uh, headquarters in, in Paris, uh, roughly almost 25 billion uh, revenue last year, uh, 100,000 employees worldwide in uh, 55 countries. So uh, yeah, kind of big, um, big playground, uh, I would say, uh, to, to, to work with. Um, and for uh, the, the lines of activities, we have three of them. Uh, mostly the biggest one is uh, dairy and uh, plant-based products. Uh, so Danone Yogurt, uh, Alpro products are part of the group as well. Uh, waters, such as, uh, such as this one. And, um, and specialized nutrition, baby food and uh, medical food. A uh, couple of certifications and my Twitter in case uh, some of you would like to, to reach out uh, after this, uh, this talk. Um, little, uh, yeah, on the, sorry, personal side of things, uh, I'm also very busy at home, full household with kids and so on, lots of hobbies. Uh, I ride uh, every, every week and I'm um, passionate about flying, about flying gliders and glider aerobatics. So the small thing I can afford to brag about is that I was a um, member of the, a few years ago, member of the French national team, glider aerobatics, and uh, participated in the world championship. So uh, yeah, quite uh, proud of this uh, achievement. Um, little disclaimer, let's say everything I'm gonna talk about is fiction, just for the, for the sake of it. Um, I will uh, talk about a few incidents or, or big events that happened, but uh, I'll be most of the time generally speaking. So not only about what happens in my job, but what I feel happens in everyone's job. Uh, in this area, and obviously all uh, views expressed are, uh, are my own. Okay, so let's start with the topic. Um, I would like to, to, to talk to you about what it means to be a cyber defender, uh, what's the job, what's the daily job. Uh, first of all, uh, if I can take a quick survey, who here in the audience is um, working on blue team, CERT, C-CERT, and that kind of Okay, I'm not on my own. Great, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'd like to also try to, to debunk part of the myth around uh, cyber defense. Um, the daily job is not always about finding APTs in our network everywhere and nation, nation state sponsored attacks and so on. The daily job is mostly business as usual. It's mostly phishing emails, so many of them, and I mean, small orgs, big orgs. Yeah, we, we get so many of them. Everyone knows it's a major risk of intrusion. So, um, so yeah, it takes a big part of our time. Phishing emails, again, I'm gonna talk uh, uh, to mention them quite a lot. 
um, CEO fraud attempts using corporate means, non-corporate means, um, again, in a wide company, that's, uh, that's happening quite often. Uh, malware detections, viruses, PUAs, uh, we have, and again, in every company, in every culture, we see different, um, different ways, different kinds of malware and viruses around the world. We have some countries are, I would say, good customers in terms of uh, incident, uh, incident detection. Uh, but it's, it's universal, it's worldwide, it's everywhere. And it takes so much of our time. We, we spend, uh, with phishing emails, so much time doing this. New vulnerabilities, we need to study, to assess, to create a detection rule, to be able to stop it and block it and so on. Uh, expose credentials. Again, in a big org, you have users using their corporate email to subscribe on another uh, website and so on. And these get pawned and exposed and, and you need to, to, to work out the consequences. Uh, oh, phishing emails, it was a, uh, it's been a long time. Uh, new malware and so on and so on. Suspicious traffic uh, uh, to, to a C2 uh, and you need to uh, go and fetch the host name, launch an investigation, see what happened and so on. And with um, the, the, um, the size of the company really makes the numbers of these uh, enormous. It's, it's huge. We also have uh, bigger things. Small incidents can transform, can get into bigger incidents. You can see them coming. So very quickly, I'll talk about um, big events that everyone went through uh, in the last few years. Uh, no surprise, WannaCry was uh, really something huge. And for a big company to assess the, the exposure, to make sure that you don't have one unpatched system in a, at the other end of the world, uh, in a whatever data center, it, it's really a challenge. And I remember you know, teams running around to, to patch everything, to make sure uh, nothing came in that could, uh, that could um, uh, break us uh, was really, really demanding. I know, and I know every company went through this. Same with NotPetya. I remember NotPetya even more vividly because every morning we would wake up where we hit. Oh no, we weren't. Okay, good. But every day there was a new company down because of th this. And, and they were losing millions, billions every day and so on. And I really feel there was a before 2017 and after 2017, it really changed uh, the way cybersecurity was seen. Cybersecurity started um, making front page news, which almost didn't happen before that. It also helped get more awareness on the topic. Uh, seeing, yeah, neighbors being really badly hit with this. More recently, uh, we had lock for shell uh, less than a year ago. Uh, it, it's not the same kind of event and not the same kind of crisis, but that's the kind of, I would say, proactive crisis that you can see coming. Obviously, on a Friday afternoon, uh, you can see Twitter and the networks and everything starting to buzz and tremble with bits and pieces of information. And you know your weekend is ruined. You're not going to have a weekend. You can cancel all your plans because you'll, you'll be there um, doing your job, trying to assess, to patch, to detect, and, and so on and so on. So um, that, that's also part of the daily job. Luckily, it doesn't happen every day but uh, often enough for us to, to remember it and to be impacted by, um, by this. Uh, internal incidents as well, uh, which uh, put everyone in a, in a panic. Um, quite a long time ago, we've had uh, one, um, I can talk about every incident we, we had, but we had one quite a long time ago uh, with one compromise account. Um, this compromised account was used to send internal phishing email to several hundred users. A uh, few of them got compromised in then churn and were used to send another uh, campaign of, uh, of uh, internal phishing emails to 
another uh, few hundred users, and so on and so on. And um, it doesn't sound big, but the team was very small at that time. It, I mean, we almost didn't sleep for two weeks. Uh, we felt we were two trains, uh, well, the attackers were two trains ahead all the time. It was exhausting. We really felt we would never uh, catch them, never reach out to them. In the end, we did, uh, with a huge backlog and, and a huge mess to, to clean. Uh, and yeah, again, very little sleep. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the job. It's also in all these crises, that's where you create awareness, that well, that's where you get uh, all the users and the rest of the IT teams helping you. Um, and you know, doing, everyone's doing their part. It's also quite nice to, to see this. And, um, and that's where you, you move forward. You will improve your maturity, your posture, thanks to this uh, difficult uh, moment, I would, uh, I would say. Part of the job is also, from time to time, having a beer with colleagues at the end of the day, uh, after a crisis, after a great regular day. So, uh, so yeah, I thought that would uh, fit into the Brucon landscape. Um, Another part of the job uh, um, I, that I don't think we mention often enough is about communications. Uh, communicating um, about an incident, internal incident, external one. Uh, we regularly use um, uh, public external incidents to create awareness, to communicate. So the famous hack that happened uh, a couple of weeks ago with the MFA fatigue intrusion, we use this uh, to communicate to users, you know, like, don't do this. And uh, even if you receive like dozens, dozens of uh, MFA push requests, don't. So yeah, every opportunity is good to communicate. Communication is also um, with all the stakeholders about um, explaining why something happened. Because for other IT teams or non-technical people, uh, when they see, okay, a user has clicked on a phishing email, but why did they click? They had completed their awareness program and training. Shouldn't have clicked. Well, they're a user. Their job is about, you know, they were expecting that kind of email. Okay, they clicked. And we are there to, to, to make sure that there is as uh, little impact as possible. Same with MFA. How could an account get compromised when we have MFA deployed everywhere? Well, latest news, MFA can be bypassed uh, and, and you know, tokens stolen and so on and so on. And um, it's sometimes difficult to explain that Risk zero doesn't exist. Even with the newest tools and MFA and so on, incidents will keep happening, intrusions will keep happening. And, um, and yeah, even if we're very good our, at our job and have millions in all the newest tool, that's, uh, that's why we're, we're here. Another part of comms uh, is about um, working with sales representatives, so externally. I don't know if some of you have regular interaction with, uh, with salespeople. Um, I think we, we need to, to improve on both parts on that topic, uh, but it can, uh, can be a difficult part of communications as well. Um, with, uh, you know, LinkedIn connection requests, you know, like, we both work in cybersecurity, let's connect. No, no let, let's not. And I, re I mean, I and, and all my network receives dozens of these. That's, yeah, that's a bit annoying. Um, emails from sales representatives. I, I once was called by someone because I hadn't answered to any of his six emails that he had sent to me in the past two weeks, demanding a meeting with me. And again, if I were to answer every email I get from salespeople, I would spend two hours a day on this. That's not my job. I cannot do this. But it, you know, it takes some availability 
you received it, you re discard it, and so on and so on. Um, it's part of the job, but maybe you know some good practice could be could be uh, could be set up. I know it's not an easy job, definitely, uh, and we need uh, salespeople to discover new tools and technologies, innovations and, and features. But uh, but yeah, that is maybe a bit of work, a bit of a balance to be found. In the same area, not always sales uh, people, but but quite often it's in that area. Um, the marketing buzzwords uh, and and um, you know uh, clingy uh, sentences to 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 make believe that the tool is is like you know kind of magic. Um, I once had someone telling me that their tool was proactively detecting any attack before the intrusion phase and even before the reconnaissance phase. Okay, okay, no. a demo maybe? No. Um, or that uh, uh, another one was telling that they really strongly believe in AI. AI is the future because, you know, incident response teams, um, when they have an incident ticketing tool, they get uh, uh, a detection about an IP address with some weird traffic. And with AI, you can match that IP address with a host name. Like, no, come on, guys, that's called enrichment. That's not AI. So you get, you know, AI everywhere and blockchain, deep learning, machine learning, and so on. And, and so maybe, you know, if some salespeople uh, are, are watching this, maybe work a bit on the, I'm not asking to be experts, but maybe work a bit on the technical side of things to do a bit of fact checking uh, and to make sure that we can, uh, we can uh, discuss. Um, but also good salespeople, I want to acknowledge this uh, when, you know, they managed to arouse my curiosity with a new feature, something that would really help the team on a daily basis and like, okay, Let's set up a demo. I want to I wanna have a look at this. Um, I was talking about the salespeople expertise. What about ours? Um, a few years ago, well, 10, 15 years ago, we could call ourselves uh, cybersecurity experts. I honestly don't think we can do that anymore. Um, we are incident detection and response experts, incident management experts. Uh, but then in our daily job, we're being asked to evaluate a vulnerability. Um, how is that vulnerability exploited? Which are the attack techniques and methods and TTPs around this? Um, so we need to train on the offensive tools as well to be able to test and, uh, and do it in a lab or something. Um, we are being requested a few risks analysis about a specific, again, incident, exploit, uh, vulnerability, and so on. We're being asked about uh, OT expertise. Uh, that's really interesting. I mean, in, obviously, in a manufacturing company, there's a lot of it. It's uh, really interesting, but it's, it's a whole another world and a whole another expertise in terms of cybersecurity, in terms of uh, the ways of working and the constraints, uh, requirements, and so on. So, what I want to say here is that we need to keep an open mind for awareness, for creativity, to be able to do our job better, but um, some people expect us to be experts in everything. Uh, that's not something we, we can do, and uh, personally, I, uh, now I, I manage um, a bigger team than I used to. So there's team management, individual management, budget, paperwork, and all this added with the uh, requirement and, and the need personally to keep a technical expertise in my field. That's becoming more and more difficult for me and, and I guess for lots of, uh, lots of people. Uh, for example, I'll, I'm being totally transparent here. Uh, you talk to me about uh, malware uh, engineering, reversing, and so on. 
No, I'm not there. That's something I know nothing about. I understand uh, nothing about. You show me a, a, a bunch of IDA lines, assembly lines, I get a headache and, and, and that's it. Um, same for legal topics, um, security policies, governance, GDPR. I know what I need to do my job, but, but that's it. Maybe someday it's going to change and I'm going to discover more of it and say, wow, security policies, I love it, but not, not today. So um, here we are with our bits and pieces of expertise all together and we're trying to um, uh, defend, defend uh, the job, the production, the business and the purpose, in fact, is to make sure there's no impact or as little impact as possible. So I'll um, talk very quickly about the kinds of impacts we may have and, and focus on the, the bigger ones uh, afterwards. Uh, first of all, technical impact. That's obvious. You have an incident, user accounts get blocked, uh, an application is down or has been blocked by uh, EDR or whatever. That's the small you know, day to day impacts that we get. Most of all, with a real incident, a bigger one, uh, impact can get financial. Uh, when you have a whole line of business down, a factory line, a whole factory, a business application, and so on. That's, well, literally, literally money down the drain, usually. So that's where we need to work, to be fast, to be efficient. And, and yeah, that's, uh, that's where we are uh, useful. There's also uh, reputational damage. I'll fit it into the, the financial part because in the end, the uh, results are, are equivalent. Legal impacts. Again, I'm not going to spend too, too much time on this. I'm guessing that's not your favorite uh, topic. Uh, but yeah, PCI DSS, GDPR, local regulations everywhere that I'm not familiar with. So, um, so yeah, you need to, to rely on other teams, uh, other teams as well. And finally, the human impact, which um, well, financial impact obviously is really critical. But human impact is so diverse uh, and comes in so many ways. Um, I think we're just starting to see the beginning of it. Um, obviously, human impact when users cannot work uh, because the, the, the app is down, factory is down, and so on. Um, and even worse, uh, users who, people, employees who lose their job because a company has gone bankrupt because of a ransomware. Um, th that's, a, that's a really big one. On a psychological standpoint, um, cyber incidents uh, have an impact on users. And uh, we've had a, a, a case a few, well, a few, few weeks ago where a user's account has been, has been compromised and used in a, in a fraud scheme attempt. Well, did not succeed, uh, but the guy whose account was compromised was so freaked out. He was terrified of logging in again because his account and email had been used uh, in this fraud scheme. So just logging in again, was he was scared that the fraudsters would get back in because of this. And he was not trusting anything anymore uh, on his computer, on his phone and so on, and that, that's just one case, but um, I guess we have so many more of, the, of these. And the worst impact uh, we may have had, I think it, it has already happened, is impact on, on people's lives in the sense of uh, health and safety. Um, with uh, the ransomware attacks like WannaCry, which hit NHS, NHS sorry, in the UK in, uh, in 2017. So many hospitals were down, were unable to take uh, patients. Um, a month ago, a, a major hospital south of Paris was hit by Lockbit, I think. And um, yeah, they had to divert uh, patients to other hospitals. They had to reschedule operations and so on. And you know, what if one day 
um, someone doesn't get the, the health treatment he needs because of this. I'm, I'm quite sure it has happened. What if someone dies uh, because of this? Uh, there are so many hospitals being hit, uh, so many health structure. Uh, that's, uh, that's a critical uh, topic we need, uh, we need to address. Uh, critical operations can be impacted as well. The um, Florida water treatment plant in February 2021, I mean, that, um, the change in the levels was discovered just in time, but consequences would have been dramatic here. And, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many more, and I guess so many events we are not, uh, not aware of. So to go back to, um, to the initial topic, our job, yeah, defending, defending um, business operations, data, personal data, defending people, people's lives in, in some cases. Um, and against, well, against what? Just to put a bit of, um, a bit of food for thought here, uh, one could say we are good against evil because we're fighting fraudsters, attackers, and so on. That's also um, a very personal question. You know, we, we also fight, for example, in, in every company, orgs, um, uh, hacktivism. That's really a question of perspective. Some people can be aligned with the causes defended by hacktivism. Maybe not the means, but yeah, that's, uh, that's another topic. So I'll stick to we fight cybercrime in its illegal aspect, and that's it. The rest is uh, for, your, uh, for you all to, to, to decide. And fighting this, um, what is our purpose? What do we want to do? Um, we can see uh, the, way, the way we defend, the purpose of our job is also to defend uh, people's life. So that's, that makes our job uh, really, really important. And um, I mean, we are the last line of defense. We are the cavalry that comes when all the protection layers have failed before that. The firewall has failed, the proxy, the EDR, whatever. So being this last line of defense, our job is so important, and we need to do it 24-7, around the clock. Uh, we need to be there all the time, uh, to stay uh, in the evening, and so on. Um, well, I think we need to give ourselves a bit of a credit here. Uh, that's, uh, that's really important. Um, and it all fits into a, a wording I had not thought of before. Uh, a few days ago, Someone at work called me, oh yeah, yeah, you're the, you the lady in the trenches. I was like, okay, yeah, why not? And then this trenches word made me think, you know, I was talking about the last line of defense, uh, talking about the cavalry, and um, we defend all the time continuously against continuous attacks uh, that never stop. I mean, phishing emails, network scans against our public IPs and so on, that's continuous, that's never, that's never stopping. So here, um, it, I really realized it recently, we are at war. We are at war all the time. And until recently, I thought, because that's a um, wording that has been used in many keynotes and conferences, I was like, yeah, you know, and yesterday, Dave, with, uh, with uh, adapting adversaries and so on, but in my mind, that was, yeah, but that's for governments, um, you know, nation states stuff, um, critical infrastructures, and so on and so on. Not yogurt, you know, uh, but, but yes, it is, it is. We are at war against cybercrime all the time, even for, uh, for the business, for, for making yogurts and water and or any activity that that your company uh, that your company has um, so yeah it's uh, um, it's a very demanding and very exhausting um, way of thinking 
And it's, um, I mean, the number of incidents is exploding, number of attacks is exploding, number of vulnerabilities is increasing as well. We are doing this all the time with being, you know, being at war in our minds, which, which um, is really a different mindset. And um, my, my question is, how are we supposed to hold like this in the long run? We're doing this again and again on a continuous basis. Um, we're expected to, to stay later because an incident has started and you're not going to say, no, no, sorry, 6 p.m., I, yeah, I need to run away, I have pony lesson or whatever. And um, so, yeah, you stay longer and you stay connected all the time in your head. You know, what if something has happened? So you take your phone in the evening and check it. No, we're fine. Yeah. No, it's okay, we're fine and same the next morning, and same on the weekend. And that's, that's really exhausting. We're on all the time. And I'm not talking about people who are uh, on duty and who need to, to, to stay awake or, or alert at, a, at all times. So I know we... I mean, the, the, that, that's also, sorry, that's also a human impact that we need to take into account, the impact on ourselves, on our lives, on the personal and professional uh, balance. Because, yeah, if we keep up like this, we won't be doing this on the, on the long run. And, and I'm quite sure lots of you uh, recognize themselves in this picture, uh, because, again, we're always on... Um, I'm hearing about more and more people in the cybersecurity community, uh, CISOs that, that are under so much pressure. Um, I've heard about a couple that changed job, but they, they changed careers because they could not take the pressure, the permanent pressure anymore. Uh, SOC analysts uh, going on burnout because it's, it's too much, and they're doing so much additional hours, they get less and less sleep, and their personal life is really being hit uh, by this. And we need to keep up with the tooling, and the features, and the innovation, and, and so on. It's, um, you know, personally, I don't know, I mean, I love my job, but I don't know if I can work like this for... 20, 25 more years till retire. Retri sorry, till retirement. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be looking, looking like this uh, by then. So, so yeah. How how do we keep doing it in a job when you want to you want to to sustain to 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 thrive in a job? First of all, you need a purpose. The purpose, I think, we have it. We're defending our organizations, the data, and so on. So that, yeah, that's easy and easy to, easy to find. Um, on the technical level, we have the purpose as well, you know, um, bringing in more automation, detecting better, detecting more, uh, yeah, just improving uh, the, the technical ways of, uh, of working. But the purpose is not sufficient here, because we, we have that purpose already, and we see all these burnouts and, and people who can't take it anymore. We also need a reward. A reward, there are obvious uh, ways of having a reward. Um, well, obviously, uh, um, a bonus, a raise, a gift. Yeah, we'll, we'll take it, that's fine. Um, a symbolic value, like thank you, or um, uh, a promotion, uh, visibility in the community, something like that. We'll take it as well. That's good. Um, on the technical side, the reward of the way we work is uh, more added value, less false positives, more automation to focus on the... Uh, really difficult investigations, uh, the, the really bad incidents, and so on. So this we, we get as well. But there's another kind of reward that we need and that will fuel us to do that job uh, on a continuous basis. The last kind of reward we, we need is success. 
when we when we work on a big incident um, or a small one, whatever, um, we manage to detect something potentially big by doing our job uh, in the proper way. We manage to contain something and save operations from a big uh, breakdown. We manage to, I don't know, quarantine a, a massive phishing email campaign before anyone clicked or provided their credentials on the phishing uh, website. We, um, I don't know, we went threat hunting and, uh, and found a few IOC matching. Well, that might be bad news, but it is bad news. But, but we find them and put all the new detection rules in place, uh, clean everything. Yeah, that's doing our job well. That is what I call success. And when we have success, we want to do it again. We want to pursue that goal. It's, I think it also has to do with uh, neuroscience and um, uh, dopamine rush you get when you, when, um, when you have a reward, when you have pleasure and satisfaction in doing, doing something. And that's what motivates the brain to take the same right decision again the next time and to feel motivated and energized to do the same thing, uh, so to do your job well. So what I want to say here is success brings success. It's a virtual circle. I know we have, we, we already love the job. We have the adrenaline rushes when, when, whenever we are in a big incident and we want to be there. We want to do our part and investigate, contain and so on. And, and even if it's in the middle of the night, we'll always do it. But on the longer term, um, it's, it's really about being energized, being successful, both on the human side of it and the technical side of it, um, implementing our tooling well and so on, and working well as a team. I really believe cybersecurity is a team sport. It's a team activity. During an incident, everyone has their mission, their job, their tasks, and it all fits together when it's running well. And um, it works for the community as well. I mean, being here, all of us uh, gathered, that's part of the success. That's part of the reward. That's what keeps us energized to keep doing our job and uh, doing it well in order to keep fighting cybercrime. So, um, well, in a nutshell, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it in with this. I don't know what our job will look like tomorrow in three years or five years from now. The, I mean, on the defensive side, at least, the socks and certs. Um, I'm thinking it might change a lot because all the field is evolving so fast. But um, whatever the changes, uh, and these changes, I guess, will define them all together as a community. But whatever these changes, um, yeah, we need to, to keep working together uh, towards success and to fuel success with success. And I know it's a kind of a, a bit of a naive uh, conclusion, very, but I needed to put um, a positive and optimistic message into this. I just wanted to thank you to thank all the community for being here, for energizing uh, ourselves and uh, keeping this motivation and this, this energy uh, to, to keep doing our jobs as, uh, as properly and as well as we can. And that's it. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much, Sabine for uh, this great talk. Um, we have some time left if there's people who want to ask questions. Thank you very much, Sabine, for a very excellent talk. It, uh, it was really nice to, um, generally speaking, relate to a lot of things that you said as a blue teamer. And um, my question is about um, another topic that uh, security teams have to struggle with, budget. So, do you have any recommendation for teams that are not there yet, that are still trying to develop the language or 
I don't know, the, the tools to convince management about some of the necessary investment that needs to be done. That's my question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks for being here. Thanks for your question. Um, here, um, in my experience, there are two things that uh, can, can help on the, to, to get a bit more budget. First one, you won't like it. It's crisis incidents, you, you go through something big, and well, um, then yeah, you get more budget, job openings, and so on. But uh, yeah, that's not the nice way of getting there. The other one is something um, I don't uh, adhere to, uh, but it can work, is uh, to compare yourself with peers. And saying, okay, look at that company in the same um, domain of activity or it's you know comparable size of company and they've done this and this and that and they are way ahead of us in terms of maturity that's you know can can um, sometimes with some people hit in the right place Uh, thank you, first of all. Uh, I have a question related to ransomware. So I heard it in this talk, but I hear it in a lot of small companies and large companies. The biggest fear and risk is being hit by ransomware. So a lot of companies, they start uh, ransomware resilience and ransomware readiness uh, pro projects, but mostly they're focusing on compliance. Do we have a policy? Do we have a procedure? Do we have an EDR? Do we have a vulnerability? management process in place but actually you should be focusing on the effectiveness of all the procedures and tooling is there any advice you have from a large companies such as Danone how to measure the effectiveness of all your solutions that are in place measure effectiveness oh that's uh, <laughs> I was talking about expertise <laughs> earlier <laughs> that's not my best area um, I fully agree with you. It's not only about compliance and, and having processes written and so on. Um, well, I obviously focus on the technical uh, measures. We have uh, the tooling, uh, detection and response tooling, uh, quarantining, network segregation, uh, whatever. Measuring effectiveness uh, on this to be fully honest with you, I don't think that's even possible because the risk is, is really big and you can put all the detection and response measures in place being, you know, you have all the, the, the box uh, ticked, you're all green and then you have someone opening a port on the internet uh, I don't know, VPN access, RDP, SSH, whatever, and it's a door in and you're done. So with, for all your effectiveness measurement, risk zero doesn't exist again. So I'm sorry, it's not really an answer, uh, but... Uh, Difficult topic. It is. <laughs> I think... Oh. Um, first of all, hello. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks for your talk and uh, the inspiration. Uh, you talked a lot about uh, fighting and, um, and war against uh, something what happened. Uh, my question is about um, how are you doing um, and it's uh, near the budget <laughs> thing, how, how improve you the mindset uh, change in the organization? Um, that's, that's very difficult. Uh, again, using incidents, um, internal or external ones, that's usually quite effective when you say, okay, that company, they are totally down because of what of what happened because of this because of a phishing email or something like that so using examples really helps um, penetration tests and red teaming 
helps as well, you know, to have the proof that, uh, that yeah, they gone in and it was uh, easy or difficult, whatever, but, uh, but uh, that usually helps uh, create, um, uh, well, helps, uh, how to say this in English, prise de conscience, realization for, for managers and executives that something needs to be done. There's no magical recipe there, but um, yeah, but, uh, we can we can try discussing it afterwards. I think it's a long topic. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. No, me neither. But for example, you know, the um, awareness is also about the users. Uh, lots of people are blaming the users for clicking uh, and, and putting the responsibility on them. When I talk to users, I try to encourage them to tell them you are also a line of defense. You can help us protect the company. You can hit the report suspicious button in, in your email, in your mailbox to, to help us detect anything weird. And if you do that, then we will check who else in the company received the email and we, we can quarantine and so on and so on. So we try to empower them with, uh, well, that's what I do, empower them with the belief that they can help. Whenever they have a doubt, they, they hit the button. And if they don't, well, again, we are the last line of defense and we'll try to make sure we, we catch it and, and so on. Uh, but you need to reach to all the users. That's a huge challenge. And yeah, it doesn't work with, with everyone and it doesn't work with, um, for the management awareness part and budget part. It's all different, uh, different topics and uh, yeah, I haven't found the magical recipe yet either. Any other questions? No, then uh, I think thank you again, Sabine, thank you. for being here and for a great talk.